All right, thyroid gland. Looks like a little butterfly. Okay? Um, and if, if my hand is the thyroid, and this is the trachea, the thyroid is going to go around the trachea like this. But when you look down on it, it doesn't go all the way around. It doesn't have a O shape. It has like a U shape. So when you turn it around, you're going to see the ends. I'll show you what it looks like behind there. But it's, it's this butterfly in the front, but it doesn't wrap itself all the way around. It's just on the side. Does that make sense? It's like a U shape. Okay? And on the back, we're going to talk about the parathyroid. So like P little glands that sit on those ends of the, of, of the thyroid. Um, so it looks like a little butterfly. All right, you've got two lobes over here connected by an isthmus. It is highly vascular, meaning that there's five blood vessels that go on one side and five blood vessels on the other side. If this ever has to get removed in anyone in your family, make sure you have a highly skilled surgeon. They're, they're usually very uh, confident about the way they do these, but there's... If you admit it, it, could be, it could be a very bloody surgery because there's so many blood vessels there. If it's an elective surgery, you might even want to consider, if it's your mom or something, you might want to go with your mom to see the doctor and say, is there a way, it doesn't have to be done right now, maybe a month from now, um, can I donate my, my blood to, or can she donate blood? You know what I'm saying? Just to have it on the side. Um, surgeons are well aware that this, is a, this can be a very bloody uh, surgery, so they're very... Um, they're very um, conscientious. Yeah, conscientious and very careful uh, of not hitting those spots. But they, um, but things can go wrong. You know, if it's let's say a, a cancer tumor uh, that's just wrapped all around, you don't know where the blood vessels are because the cancer just it, it's hard to dissect it all out. So um, that's all I want to say. It's, it's, it's highly vascular, and you might want. To, it, yeah, uh, I, I had a very interesting case uh, when I was a medical student and. Um, it was a Jehovah Witness, um, and she didn't want to. She lost a lot of blood when they removed this from her, and uh, she didn't want any blood transfusion. Uh, she made it, but barely. She, she, uh, so um, nothing good or bad. With it. I'm just saying these are the things that you will encounter when you're in the hospitals, and you have to respect people's religions and stuff. But you know, um, you know, you have to also explain to them the risk that they have to deal with before the surgery, especially if you know about the. Uh, the religious uh, cultures and stuff. So. All right, so uh, thyroid releases three hormones. I know we only talked about two, but there is actually three hormones that get released here. There's one called triote, tri tri it's called T3. <laughs> All right, uh, no, it's triiota uh, thyronine. And uh, this increases the rate of metabolism, okay? Now, let me just ask you this. By just the name, what do you think is a supplement that you need in your diet to make this? Iodine, right? That's why you need iodine in your diet. That's key to understand about certain conditions that we're going to talk about. All right? Iodine is important in here. Um, and this is, this is the active form, the T3 form. We'll explain what the, well, the, what the 3 stands for is how many iodine ions are on there. And there's 3. Okay? And we're going to talk about how this is formed in a moment. So this is dependent on iodine in our diet. Oh, the answer was right up there. I didn't mean to say that. But you knew that by just looking at the word. Okay, that's good. So that's our active form. But we also have an inactive form, uh, T4, and that's called thyroxin. We have T3 and T4 floating throughout all our bloodstream. And the liver is going to convert T4 to T3. T3 is very active. There is some forms of T4 that is active, but it's very little. It's not as potent as T3 but we have a lot of T4 floating around our bodies. When the T3 is used up, the T4 gets converted to T3, and then we can use that. Again, T3 is what's going to increase your metabolic rate. Okay? So those are our two, when we refer to the thyroid hormones, we're talking about these two that relate to metabolism. It's just, you'll learn as you go along uh, through your whole courses, thyroid hormones referring to T3 and T4. Not this other one that's known as calcitonin. Although that does come out and it is a thyroid hormone, it's not, re it's not referred to as one of the thyroid hormones uh, collectively. Calcitonin is important in terms of calcium levels. 
when calcium levels are very high in your bloodstream, and we all know that calcium is more important than, than bones and teeth, right? You need calcium to be able to contract muscles, to do nerve conduction. Calcium is so vital for our bodies to do all these things. If you can't make your heart contract, you're dead. Who cares about bones? Bones is like secondary. It's all the way down the bottom of the list. It's more important for contracting muscles and nerve stimulation. Well, so we've got to always make sure we have a good supply of calcium in the bloodstream. Not too much. That's why we have that thermostat going on, right, with energy system. So if we have too much calcium in the blood, then here's a good mnemonic for you. Calcitonin is going to tone down the calcium. All right? It's going to decrease it. All right? Does that make sense? So that's what's going to happen here. It's going to decrease calcium. It does the opposite effect of parathyroid glands. Parathyroid glands that we're talking about is going to increase calcium levels when calcium levels are low. So it does this Peter talk. Pretty easy to understand. Okay? Calcitonin is going to go to three different places. Where is calcium going to be coming from? Those are the three places. If we got to put the calcium back in those areas, what areas are we talking about? Bones? And what specifically is it going to do? Let's go back to A and P1. Is it going, I'll, I'll help you out, is it going to increase the activity of osteoclast or is it going to increase the activity of osteoblast? One is going to build bone, one is going to destroy bone. Osteoblast. It's going to increase osteoblast activity, taking calcium for the bloodstream, letting the osteoblast put it back into bone. Okay, so its target is specifically osteoblast for bone. Okay, it's also going to go to the kidneys and say, hey, let if there's calcium that goes in the kidneys, let it pee it out. We don't need that extra calcium. Right? Remember, calcitonin tones down calcium. It's also going to go and target the small intestines. The small intestines is going to absorb all the foods that you're eating. So it's going to tell the intestine, small intestines, hey, look, I know you're drinking a lot of milk. But the calcium that's in the milk, no need to absorb it into our bloodstream. Just let it go out your, your poop or let it go out your, your pee. It's fine. We don't need the extra amount. You see? And parathyroid glands, we haven't talked about it yet, but it goes to the same places. It just does the opposite effects to get calcium into the bloodstream. It tells the kidneys, don't pee it out. It goes to the bones and say, osteoclasts work overtime and get the calcium into the bloodstream. Goes to the small intestines and says, calcium, we need to absorb you from the milk. So don't let it go out your poop, just we need to absorb it. All right? So the same place, but these two opposite effects. Now the other thing I want to just say about these three different things, look at this. T3, what stimulates T3 to come out? We did that before over here. Think of the hypothalamic pituitary target axis. What is going to make TSH, a hormone, is going to tell T3 to come out. TSH, from the anterior pituitary, of the thyroid, to spit out T3. Okay? What makes T4 come out? No. TSH, same thing. TSH is also going to make T4 come out of the thyroid. So T3 and T4 are controlled hormonally, right? Hormones controlling it. What's going to make calcitonin come out? The level of calcium. Is calcium a hormone? No, it's a non-hormonal thing. So we're going back to what I said before. Hormones come out for three different ways. Either stress and oral reason, a hormone reason, or a non-hormonal reason. Does that make sense? Okay? I'll put this all together for you. All right. Oh, and just to give you an idea, euthyroidism is a fancy word to say, hey, look, the thyroid is producing an adequate amount of, um, of T3 and T4 at a nice steady rate, as opposed to hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Okay? Now, I do want to go over the histology of the thyroid with you and just go over the, the conditions and I'll be done with it. This one you do need to know. It's easy to understand, though. 
Okay? Think of think of balloons. Okay? You got a balloon and we're gonna fill it up with pink liquid. Okay? The balloon itself, the latex itself, are follicles, are follicular cells. Inside is pink liquid, and this pink liquid is called collagen. The follicle cells make T3 and T4, and then they spit it into the colloid where it gets stored until it's time to get into the bloodstream. Okay? You have a bunch of these follicles in the thyroid that are filled with T3 and T4. So we're going to take a bunch of those balloons that have the pink liquid and pour them all into here. So now you got a whole fat basket full of balloons with pink liquid. Then I'm going to get some of those styrofoam uh, peanut, packaging peanut stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Those little, when you want to mail a vase to your mother or whatever, you put it in a box and you can put all those packaging peanuts. You know, styrofoam, you know what I'm talking about, right? So take some of those packaging peanuts, pour them in there, and shake this. Now, the packaging peanuts go all between the balloons. Does that make sense? Yeah. Those are what we call parafollicular cells. And the parafollicular cells is what's responsible for making calcitonin. So if you have balloons, And they're all filled with this pink liquid. The purple here is actually the follicular cells. Inside is going to be the colloid. The follicular cells are going to make T3 and T4, spit them into the colloid to get stored until the blood vessels, which lie all around here, highly vascular, are going to then get the T3 and T4 into the bloodstream. In between all of this, we have parafollicular cells. Again, the word para means next to. So it's next to the follicles. And that's what's going to spit out calcium. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, calcitonin. So it's this. And we got microscope slides, we'll show you that next time. The microscope slides showing the same thing. So here's your follicles. The follicular cells are all these little things over here. Here's your colloid. The parafollicular cells, very difficult to see. I wouldn't ask you that on the test. Um, I mean, on, on a practical exam. But there are cells in between these areas here. Okay. Now, the synthesis of making T3 and T4, you need to understand. So let me show you. It's very easy to understand this. Okay. Um, everything I'm going to explain is right here, but I think the picture is going to be worth a thousand words. Now, the only thing I got to say about this picture, I love the picture. I would have chose uh, different colors. When I go back to this picture here, this to me looks like pink broken stained glass. There is nothing else that looks like this in all of histology. And when I see this, I know I'm in the thyroid. You see, it looks like pink broken stained glass. Okay? The colloid is usually, as far as I've seen it, has always been pink. So this picture here, the colloid is yellow. All right? So you just got to bear with the colors on here. So that's the colloid in yellow, and then the follicular cells is pink here, and then there's a blood vessel. So here's a bigger view of this. Here's your colloid. Here's a follicular cell, and here's the bloodstream. Do you see? Can you get oriented? Yeah? Okay. So this is what's going to happen. In the bloodstream, you're going to have iodide. 
iodide is coming into the follicular cell, which is going to make P3 and P4. All right? It's going to take, it's going to make bravoglobulin. Anything globulin means a protein. So we all know how to make proteins. Transcription, translation, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to go into that. So it's going to go through endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, whatever. It's then going to go and make this spiral globulin and go into here. Okay? Iodine is going to come in here. It's going to get oxidated and become active. Just understand iodine is coming in here. Okay? It's going to be attached to tyrosine when it comes in here. That's a little dash is. Okay? What's going to happen here, to make life easier to understand, is that if there's two iodines on here, then we say that's T2. If there's one, it's T1. They're not going to do anything until you get T3 and T4. I think you can figure out how to make T3 and T4 by first grade math. Right? You take a T1 and a T2, you got T3. <laughs> You make a T2 and a T2, you got T4. What happens with T1 and T1? Well, all right, you got T2 and you can use that. All right? Once you make the T3 and T4, comes out as a lysosome, it gets stored over here until the time needs to go out, and then it goes out here as T3 and T4. That's it. I mean, you need to understand that, but that's... I think that's fairly easy to understand. Questions on that? No? All right. Transport and regulation. Uh, this is dealing with the thyroxin binding globulins. And it goes back to what I said. Some, uh, some T3 and T4, they, they may be free. Some of them walk to school and some go on the bus. Some of them are free floating throughout the bloodstream, some are attached to proteins. These proteins are called TBGs, or thyroxin binding globulins. That's what this is telling all that. Okay? And the regulation is by negative feedback. Okay? Uh, and these are the things it's going to do. It's going to increase metabolism, increase body temperature, increase normal growth and development. Yes, if you have low levels of thyroxin, T3 and T4, you will have a short stature. As much as you need growth hormone, you also need thyroid. And you also need some of the sex steroids too. Right? Testosterone stuff. So you need a mixture of stuff. Okay? Again, this is referring to mainly T3 and T4, not the calcitonin. Okay? So again, the amount available, we have a lot more T4 than T3, but T3 is much more potent and more active than T4. Okay? But the 4 and the 3 refer to the iodine ion. Okay? And these are all the, you just memorize these over here, but these are the ones, these are the functions of T3, which is mainly the metabolism. Okay? I just want to do this one thing for you and I'll let you guys go, is the diseases of the thyroid. Okay? So, Thyroid enlargement definitions. You've heard of these words, I'm sure of it, okay, or maybe parts of them. We have thyromegaly, which is a mild to moderate enlargement of the thyroid. A goiter, right? Show of hands, who's heard of a goiter? Right, most of you, right? Goiter is a chronic progressive enlargement. It usually happens over a matter of months to years, okay? Keep in mind, even though I'm going to go over these pretty briefly with you, you can have an enlarged thyroid and yet produce a steady rate of hormones also. Okay? So it could get complicated, which we won't get into. But I always put these little green things in here because I don't want you to find out later on in your nursing program and you're going to say, well, Dr. Carmel said all of this. Now the fine print over here is not all of it. You'll understand that later uh, when you get into those fields, but not right now. All right, so we can have um, etiology of thyroid enlargement. A simple goiter. Now just think about this. A simple goiter is this. It's non-toxic. It's a demic, meaning like a group, a population will all have the same, uh, same thing over here. And it's when there's a lack of iodine. Now I've seen a case like this, or heard about a case, read about a case, um, with the Amish uh, population in Pennsylvania. The Amish where they 
you know, they grow all their foods and they eat their foods. So what happened here is that they, this was a number of years ago, they found out a lot of the people in the Amish, because they eat all the foods that they, they make, they got a lot of goiters. And they're like, what's going on here? Turns out that the foods that they're eating, the soil didn't have enough iodine. So when they were eating all the vegetables, they weren't getting a supplemental amount of iodine throughout their whole body. So what was happening is the thyroid was hungry or craving for more iodine. So what does it do? It upregulates. It's going to become bigger, but astronomically, you can actually feel it. It gets bigger trying to make a bigger net to grab whatever iodine's out there. Even if it's very little, we want to make sure that it sees the thyroid to go in there. Does that make sense? So that's what's happening with this. So how do you fix it? Easy thing. Just give them supplemental iodine. You see these things start shrinking down. All right? Pretty easy to understand that one. Okay? Um, adenoma or a nodule, it just means that if, um, if the thyroid... in a shape like this, if there's one area where it's growing out. Could it, be, it could be cancers, it might not be cancers. All right? But it's just one nodule, one area there. Okay? Or an adenoma, one little bump. Okay? Um, we could also, oh, I'm sorry, let me just go. That's one little bump. But if you have a lot of bumps on here, what happens here is that when you have so much of this, the whole thyroid, when you feel it, palpate it, it feels bigger, but it feels like you have all these bumps. We call that multi-nodular. Right? If you hear these words with your parents or yourself, that's what they're referring to. And then the other one that we have is autoimmune disease, which I explained to you about Graves' disease, right? Yeah. Now it's an imposter. This auto, uh, auto antibody turns on that... that um, that thyroid to produce an extra amount of T3 and T4. And that's what happens there. We also have something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Who here has heard of Hashimoto's? Few of you probably. Yeah. This is also an autoimmune disease, but it does the opposite. Graves' disease actually, when it links over here, turns it on, spits off the T3 and T4. Hashimoto's produces autoantibodies, binds over here, and turns it off. So when you learn more about autoantibodies in your field, don't think that you just turn things on. They could also turn things off. Okay. Um, so here's pictures of some goiters. Uh, they're probably large. You've probably seen some of this stuff. All right. Um, so that's that's why I look at people. I can't help you. People start wearing turtlenecks after today. I said that's that's what's happening. All right. That's an large. I mean, it's probably obvious. You can't hide that. Um, so if you're making too much T3, and again, I'm referring to just T3 and T4. If you're making too much T3 and T4, an excess amount, we call it hyperthyroidism. Now, if it's T3 and T4 is supposed to do metabolism, you're going to have too much metabolism. You're going to make too much energy. So are these people going to be thin or obese? Thin, all right, because they're making a lot of energy, okay? Um, if you have too much, it happens too fast, we actually can call it thyrotoxicosis. Um, it's the second most common endocrine disease, so you should know these kinds of things as you're going into your fields. It's next to diabetes mellitus. That's the number one endocrine disease. Okay. Um, females have it more than males, um, and that happens with all autoimmune diseases. It's usually a, a 3 to 1 ratio, or 3 to 2 ratio, something like that. There's more females that, that have uh, these autoimmune diseases than males. Um, does not affect the calcitonin, okay, as I explained to you. Um, you would make too much T3 and T4, it's going to increase your metabolism, okay. Some signs and symptoms, um, they may have a goiter over there, which is enlarged, it's going to produce a lot of T3 and T4. Their bodies are going to be shaken because you're making a lot of energy and your, your muscles are going to start contracting vigorously, okay. <laughs> Tachycardia, that's a fancy word. You should know that. We're going to get into it later, but you should know it. Cardi means heart rate, or tachy means fast. You get a, heart, or a fast heart rate. It would make sense. Your metabolism is going faster. Everything's going to go faster. 
You're going to have palpitations. You're going to feel your heartbeat without even putting your hand here. I can feel my heart. You shouldn't feel it. But when it goes that fast, you will. Restlessness. You'll be vacuuming and doing everything, you know, just like I can't sit down. I've got to just do something. You have all this energy. You get diarrhea. What? Body's not metabolizing. Mm, well, where though? No. When I say that every all your muscles are contracting, keep in mind smooth muscles. So smooth muscles around intestines, they're squeezing. So they're not giving an opportunity for water to get absorbed into your bloodstream, into your you know, into your body. So the water stays in your stool. And it just contracts and just pushes out the water too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you get diarrhea with that. Okay. Um, weight loss for obvious reasons. You're just burning off all those calories. Irritability. Just can't sit down. Okay. Heat intolerance. You know, it could be let's say 30 degree weather, but you know, I gotta wear a tank top. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but that's basically what it is. When it's cold outside, you're sweating. Okay. Not cold, but you, you know what I'm saying. That's what heat intolerance is. All right. Um, Graves' disease, again, uh, we just talked about this before. It's the most common form of hyperthyroidism. It's an autoimmune disease that turns on the receptors for TSH, which means that you're going to produce a lot of T3 and T4. And even though we have all those symptoms that I just talked about, hyperthyroidism, you also get these specific ones also in terms of Graves' disease. So when I see all those and I see these two, I know the reason why you have it too. All right? You don't have to have all these. You might have two of the three. You might just have one of the three. You might have none of it because it might be an early stage of it. But you'll get a, diff a diffuse uh, goiter. It's not going to be just one area. The whole thing will be enlarged. You'll get this very, and I'll show you pictures of it. The eyes are bulging out. And the mechanism that they're thinking is causing this is that they have so many autoantibodies that are building up behind the eye that it's pushing the eyes out. Okay, that's the theory they're, they're thinking about that. All right, if it's just one eye that's being pu pushed out, then that's not because of a, a thyroid issue. That's not a systemic thing. I'm thinking more of a tumor that's pressing against that. But both eyes, I'm thinking more systemically. Then they also get this thing called pretibial myxedema, which gets this dried, we call it edematous, water uh skin that happens in front of the shin, pretibial, in front of the tibia. All right, so that's what I'm talking about. You get this bulging of the eyes, and the way you can see that, you see the square, the white of the eyes under the iris? You shouldn't see it above it. When you look at each other, you only see sclera white underneath the iris. The only way you can see the sclera above is you got it like this. So they always have that scared look, right? You look like this. I look at people, I keep in mind, I don't want to judge people, I'm just saying, person's you got to put it all together, but they could very well look like that all the time. But if I've known them and I they, something's changed, then that's what I'm saying. Over there. And you can see there's a fullness in the neck there. Uh, and you can see, you can see how it's pronounced, how it's bulging out like that. Right? That's not pre-tibial myxedema, that's post-tibial myxedema. That is not a part of Graves' disease. But I couldn't find a good, severe case of pretibial myxedema because it's usually very, it's almost like by feel, and I couldn't get a picture of that. But if you see something like this in the front, that's pretibial myxedema. It's a dried, watered down area over there. Okay? So that's what that is. And Marty Feldman, if you know him from Young Frankenstein, he had uh, Graves' disease. It got more pronounced, he got in a big car accident, and he even broke his nose over there. Um, and he was an actor, but they said he'll never make it. But then he got all these eyes and stuff, and uh, he was put in a lot of horror movies. Um, although he was in that comedy, Young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder. Um, and he played Igor, right? No, Igor. Right? And if you've seen the movie, you'll see. All right. Um, the last thing I just want to do is just the deficiency of this. The deficiency of too little T3 and T4, we call hypothyroidism, or a fancy word called myxedema. Don't get mixed up with pretibial myxedema. If you know what that looks like, think of this, but now you have that pretibial myxedema on the whole body. It's not so pronounced, you'll see it in the face, and I'll show you pictures.
the most common cause of this is treatment for hyperthyroidism. Your thyroid is producing too much T3 and T4, maybe there's a tumor there. So we're going to remove the tumor. But we took out the whole thyroid, so now you've got hypothyroidism. Does that make sense? So hint, hint, keep in mind that that's the most common reason or the most common cause of hypothyroidism is treatment to hyperthyroidism. Okay? Um, and that's why they tend to do a subtotal thyroidectomy, meaning that they'll leave, if they can, it's not due to cancer, it's something we could, they would want to leave in about one-seventh of the thyroid so that you could actually get some benefit of some T3 and T4 out of there, as opposed to removing the whole thing. So they try to do a subtotal thyroidectomy. Okay? So again, it doesn't affect the calcitonin, and we have a decrease of T3 and T4, the metabolism decreases, and these are the signs of it. It's kind of the opposite of what you would see with hyperthyroidism. Instead of tachycardia, fast heart rate, now you're going to get heart rate, and Brady means slow. So they get a slower heart rate. They get constipation, because the muscles around the intestines are not squeezing as much, so now the water gets really absorbed, so by the time it comes out of your stool, it's all dry, and it's difficult to push it out because there's not much water there. Okay? Um, weight gain, obesity, cold intolerance, you know, it's like you know, 100 degrees, but I need a sweater. That's right? just the opposite. So they get thickened edematous, dry skin, and you'll see that. I'll show you a picture of that. Their hair becomes very brittle. That's one of the things you should look into if your mother's losing her hair. She'll deny it. Um, but if she's losing her hair, you know, just say, Mom, why don't you get your thyroid checked? Because it could be the one of the earliest signs of some kind of hypothyroidism. And we'll see that. They usually are very depressed, lethargic, a decreased sexual drive. These are the things that, like, you need to find out the cause of it. If someone who's very depressed, the first thing people want to do is just hand out the antidepressant medication. But that's just putting a Band-Aid on it. If you do a TSH level, thyroid function test, and find out that it's low, the, 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 T, the uh, T3 and T4, then if you correct the T3 and T4, the depression will just correct itself. You see what I mean? So you've got to be smart with these things. Um, and this uh, looks like probably your next door neighbor. You know, uh, just uh, you, you see the, the thinning of the hair, you see the, the thickness of the skin getting thick there. Um, even the eyebrows are falling out a little bit. And that could be a normal thing too, but you know, it's easy to do a thyroid function test and just make sure you're treating the right thing. Okay? Um, and like I said, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, chronic inflammation, destruction of the thyroid, uh, it's an autoimmune disease that goes to the thyroid and turns it off. Okay? And when it does, you're not going to make T3 and T4 uh, what's happening over there. There's two stages of it. We usually miss this stage. It gets so, because it's being attacked by these autoantibodies, it inflames. It gets bigger for a short amount of time, like a week or whatever, and then it shrinks because it doesn't, it's not going to be produced all. So all the tissue gets destroyed. So it usually gets enlarged. It may have a goiter there, but usually people will miss that because it happens so quickly. Um, but we usually see the thyroid uh, tissue get destroyed. And she's got Hashimoto's. Okay? So I try to put a lot of uh, people up there so you can remember those, those people. And um, the only thing I want to say more about this, this is what I think, cretism. Um, kids can be born without a thyroid, or be born with a thyroid that doesn't produce T3 and T4. This can cause major problems. Okay? One of the biggest things it causes is mental retardation. But let's face it, when a baby comes out, you can't assess the mental status of a baby until two years later, right? Well, the problem is, is that we've got to catch this early because by the time two years, up, two years comes up, it's too late to fix it. So we don't see cretinism as much in America because when the baby leaves after, you know, when the baby's born, before it gets discharged, it will check to see if they have this. And we will correct it by giving thy thyroxine to the baby for the rest of his life because it's not producing that. So we don't see it as much because of that. But they'll get dwarfism because it has something thyroid's needed to for growth, protruding tongue, and this other stuff. And it's got pictures like this. Uh, we just don't, I've never seen it. I know they always test for it, but the baby would look similar to that because it's enlarged tongue. Okay? Um,